This episode of Armed Lutheran Radio is purely intended for entertainment purposes. Armed Lutheran Radio does not advocate or encourage the abuse of alcohol. Please drink responsibly and with moderation. We do not, under any circumstances, accept responsibility for any damages that result to yourself or anyone else due to the consumption of alcoholic beverages while listening to leftist pastors, or at any other time. As such, Armed Lutheran Media Company, LLC, and its contributors do not accept liability for any loss, damage, or inconvenience that occurs as a result of listening to bad theology, nor drinking alcoholic beverages as a result. Where gun culture meets the gospel. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competitive shooting, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode number 359. It was going to be 360, but I, being the consummate professional that I am, failed to record what would have been episode 359 last night. So... <laughs> You get the pastor early, which is not a bad thing. Pastor Bennett, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Glad to be back. And uh, hope you are feeling better. I um, know you had some some stuff done recently, and it's prompted a little bit of whiskey tonight, which is not a bad thing. Yes. Kids, take care of your teeth, because when they have to pull them, you can't get them back. No. <laughs> They, the, here's the thing that sucks is that they didn't even let me keep the tooth so I could put it underneath the pillow for the tooth fairy and maybe get yeah. a bottle of whiskey in the morning or something. Really? That's yeah. Uh, that stinks. Dentists are the worst. No offense to dentists who are listening. We <laughs> we love you. Um, so today we're going back to our ruts. We're um we're getting back to our our old ways, fisking the nonsensical babblings of anti-gun Christians. So, but before, before we do that, um, I want to thank the members of the Reformation Gun Club for making all of this possible. Today, I want to thank Mark from St. Paul, Minnesota, Matthew from Nixon, Missouri, Paul from Sheridan, Wyoming, Kurt from Rialto, California, Ethan from Auburn, Indiana, Brian from Riverton, Wyoming, Drew from Excelsior Springs, Missouri, Ron from Lexington Park, Maryland, Mitch from Stockbridge, Michigan, and Russell from Trenton, North Carolina. Thank you all so much for your support for Armed Lutheran Radio, and thank you to all of the members of the Reformation Gun Club. Um, We are listener-funded. We don't have any advertising. We don't have any sponsors. So we rely on these good people and many more to help us keep the lights on. If you would like to find out more, if you'd like to uh, get all the great benefits of hundreds of hours of exclusive content, some cool armed Lutheran swag like the t-shirt I'm wearing, um, and uh, just the satisfaction of knowing that you made this nonsense possible, <laughs> visit armedlutheran.us slash gun club and check out all the benefits and all the tiers there today. Membership starts at just fifteen seventeen per year. All right, we have not done this in a while, and it's a sad thing. Uh, we used to do this all the time, but it kind of got old after a while because more and more these guys, they were more speech. They were like political speeches more than they were sermons. Yeah. Well, and, and it seemed like it was just the same old thing. You know, you look at piles of dog crap in your yard <laughs> and you it's realize hard to pick they out the better the ones. Same. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's just, it was the same old material, which it seemed like we were making the same old arguments, but the one we're going to look at today, this guy's a, a special kind of stupid. I don't know how else to put it. <laughs> so, yep. So I started digging up in, in digging through videos and stuff, uh, trying to find some things in now that the the gun debate has sort of hotted up again with the the recent mass shootings and all the call out from uh, Democrats around the country to do something, which in there which really means just ban things, 
Which, so, which on, on that note, it seems very mysterious that the, uh, what was it, Kentucky or Nashville or the Nashville shooter, yeah. Yeah. How, how, how the, um, the manifesto that was reported to have existed just seems to have evaporated into this, the ether. It yeah. Might, I mean, I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that this was a, a transvestite who committed the, the murders. So, yep. Which is exactly why it disappeared off the, off the face of the earth and yeah. in terms of news. Um, and I mentioned this in the not recorded, you'll have to take my word for it online hangout this week. <laughs> um, <laughs> that I think daily wire had actually requested a copy of the manifesto and Nashville police are like, nah, not giving it to you. Yeah. So, it's it's that's going to get memory hold and and then we'll just move on to other things because it doesn't fit the narrative right and that was the case that's actually been the case in a lot of these recent shootings you get down in in alabama the shooting down there that doesn't fit the narrative because you're talking about black teenagers who are already ineligible to own or even possess a firearm shooting people with apparently fully auto uh, converted fully automatic handguns um and it's black on black so yeah don't want well, to talk about that there was another one where it was a bank shooting yep and that one kind of disappeared as well because the shooter's own words sounded very much like he was doing this to make a political point because of all the the anti-trans stuff that's been going on so yeah yeah it's amazing how um you know we've we've talked about the 72 hour rule that john korea uh kind of came up with where you just don't talk about this stuff for 72 hours because you're going to find out a whole lot uh about the truth beyond 72 hours and it never fails that the left jumps right in with both feet in the opening minutes of in the aftermath of one of these shootings. And it really does. It hardly takes 72 hours before we find out that everything that we thought early on and the news was reporting as gospel is actually BS. And now we got to just completely forget about it and move on to something else. Let's talk about Trump some more and get, yeah. Get away well, from this. And now if you really want to find out what's going on, you have to find the rug over at the DOJ that the FBI is sweeping everything underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the DOJ is busy um, uh, filing complaints or lawsuits against the state of Tennessee for banning the mutilation of, uh, of children yeah. instead of actually doing something about violent crime they're yeah. they're worried about the trans issue did you uh hear about the uh the reporter that c confronted the uh director of the atf about hunter biden lying on his form 4473 i saw the questioning just the question of like well are you going to do something about this and he hemmed and hawed around about how he's not going to comment on yeah. ongoing investigations and we know full well there is no ongoing investigation no, but they're, well, gonna... but they're investigating this, how to most effectively make this go away. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's kind of like the, the, uh, the search terms they found on Hillary's computer about, uh, about how to use bleach bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's find ways to make this disappear. <laughs> Um, that's like, what was it? The, the Casey Anthony case where she like killed her children or whatever. Yeah. And they, they found the, uh, her Google search of how to make chloroform. Yeah. It's best to do that at the public library. If you're going to search those <laughs> kinds of things, not that we're giving any advice to yes. <laughs> child murderers, but <laughs> if you don't want, if you're up to questionable things, then don't do those searches on your own computer. Use your neighbors, <laughs> especially if you don't like them. Um, so I thought we would dig up some, some uh, recent examples of uh, 
how should we say this supposed men of the cloth like we're going to show you here in a moment um taking full advantage of another crisis to preach the gospel of gun control and uh, we did happen to find one this one comes from this is in the aftermath of that shooting we we talked about earlier the covenant christian school shooting in in nashville or was in nashville right yeah Uh, this guy's in chattanooga tennessee this is um brandon gilvin it's called a sermon on gun violence for palm sunday and and brandon has 10 subscribers (laughs) (laughs) so thank god it's only 10 i wish it was fewer yeah right uh but he'll probably triple his views after this um Brandon is the senior minister of First Christian Church in Chattanooga. So, like I said, direct in, in direct response to the, the Christian uh, school shooting in Tennessee. And here's his, here's his bio from Am- Amazon, by the way. He's an author. Uh, Brandon Gilvin is the author of Solving the Da Vinci Code Mystery, co-author of Wisdom from the Five People You Meet in Heaven, and is co-editor of Split Ticket, Independent Faith in a Time of Partisan Politics, and Help and Hope, Disaster Preparedness and Response Tools for Congregations, um, as well as co-editor of a publication called WTF, Where's the Faith? It's apparently a series of uh, something available from Chalice Press, Uh, He studied religious studies and creative writing at Hiram College in Ohio. He received his Master of Divinity from Vanderbilt in 2002. Um, What denomination is Vanderbilt connected to? Methodist, I think. Maybe. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, In both his undergraduate and graduate work, he sought to find intersection points between human creativity, a life of faith, and working for justice. There's that word. In doing so, Brandon found passions for innovative, imaginative ministry and working to ask and occasionally answer difficult questions about globalization, human rights, and engagement with grassroots issues. So... The, wor- the working for stuff, justice part is a dead giveaway. <laughs> and half of that stuff made it sound like he's your typical, most of these quote unquote, you know, I should say not the, not the liberal part is quote unquote, but the liberal Christians, the Christian part is in air quotes <laughs> that 95% of these people are more into the new age uh, ideas rather than actual biblical Christianity. Yeah. And uh, I, fa- I did find a story from life news from 2021 that pointed out that Gilvin supports the work of Planned Parenthood. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So he's so, into the satanic sacrifice of children. Yeah. He, he appeared at a press conference in Chattanooga supporting Planned Parenthood's sex education initiatives in in the city. So, oh, yes, same sex education that shows kids how to have anal sex at the age of seven. Right, exactly. How to use a condom at age five. Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> so your thoughts on a pastor who supports the work of Planned Parenthood? What what should we think of such a person? <laughs> Is a wood chipper too graphic of a yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's if the Christian faith still practiced burning heretics at the stake, that's where every and I I hate to say this, too, because this was on, you know, for those of you who ever read anything that's in Christian news, uh, used to be Herman Naughton's publication. I don't know who's in charge of it now. It gets sent to me, I think, for free because I'm a pastor. And uh, they had on the cover of that that there was a, um, a pastor is going to be one of these ethnic speakers at the St. Louis Seminary who happens to be a supporter of abortion. So, yeah, he was demonizing the decision, uh, the the Dobbs decision. So we have him in every corner of Christendom, 
Mm -hmm. And um, I wish there was a way to root them out and to discard them as the refuse that they are. But unfortunately, the powers that be in the Missouri Synod don't seem to be too interested in casting out those who are in grave error. Yeah, beware of the wolves in, in false yeah. clothing. And uh, we have uh, we have plenty in, in every denomination, and they're, they're making their way into conservative Orthodox Cuts. Lutheran <clears throat> churches as well, which is what brought us that whole controversy with the, the annotated, the annotated uh, uh, large catechism. Yes, unfortunately. Yes. All right, so we are actually going to show you this guy. I'm going to figure out how to do this. We are going to present and then that slides. We're going to share screen. Here we go. There he is. So he's very pensive, very concerned, very worried. All right, so here we go. You can hear it. Crank up the volume here. It doesn't matter how quiet it is. It doesn't matter how loud it is. You can hear it. In the still life photograph of a little girl, her hand on the window of a school bus, tears rolling down her face as she is on the way to her reunification center after a school shooting. You can hear it. It is a prayer. It is a demand. It is a hope. You can hear it as you are sitting in a meeting or sitting at home and your phone dings and there is the headline that begins active shooting. It a prayer, it is a demand, it is a hope. You can hear it in the shouts of teenagers in the state capitol as representatives walk by, ignoring them as those teenagers yell, do something, do something. You can hear it, it is a prayer, it is a demand, it is a hope, and it always sounds like Hosanna. Wait a minute. <laughs> you could easily turn this sermon into a drinking game. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that, but yeah, I should have. That would have been fun. Um, it would have been dangerous because we probably would have died of alcohol poisoning before the episode be was over. Blotto in five minutes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> So the word Hosanna um, is from the Latin and the Greek. What and uh, there's a it's Hebrew. It's from Hebrew. And Hebrew, yes, um, meaning what? To rescue, save, save us now is what I consider to be the most literal uh, translation. It's a combination of three Hebrew words. Um, one is a um, a request or an um, trying to think of the word. Don't get old, folks. You have these brain farts more frequently. Um, a hope, a prayer, a request. Yeah, it has nothing <laughs> to do with that. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so one of the words is uh, means basically please. It is a a request of desperation. Mm. And then from the Hebrew word sus to save, uh, that's where the, the soul part comes, Hosanna. And uh, and it's supposed to be immediate. The tense is immediate. So save us at this present time. Or save us now. Yes. Kind of. yes. Okay. So this is and what the pastor meant by this being a drinking game, this is he, this is a line he comes back to repeatedly. If, if you, every time he says we should, we should have done this. We really should have. Anytime he uses the word Hosanna or says, um, it is a, 
prayer, a demand, a hope. Yeah, hope. Yes. We should we should all have to drink. So yes. if you're watching when if you're watching this at home, be sure to do that. It'll be much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Um so let's all right so let's let him go on a little bit further because you'll see what he's trying to do here and where he goes really dangerously wrong hosanna hosanna drink like a shout like a protest shout do a shot and hear it, it can you pause it right prayer. there yes and he said it's a protest shout that is the most unbiblical interpretation I could possibly imagine. Because on the day of Palm Sunday, as Christ is riding into Jerusalem, this is being said in praise. The crowds were acknowledging. They also used the term son of David. That was understood within the, you know, among the Jewish people to be a title for the Messiah. Right. So the people, they're praising Christ. They are declaring that, one, we acknowledge you're the Messiah, and two, we are shouting our praises because we understand that you as the Messiah have come here to save us. And yet it is a shout of protest, according to this chucklehead. Well, you know, the Israelites were protesting against the Romans, so. Yes. And they all, and a bunch of them, including a bunch of the disciples actually believed that he was going, that Jesus's mission was an earthly one. And it wasn't until the third day they figured it out. Right. Right. <laughs> but, and, and that's one of the um, common teaching points. And I, I have spoken on this myself that there were many within Israel that misunderstood the reason that the Messiah had come. However, I don't think that negates the praise that was proclaimed on that day. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that everybody within the crowd was seeing his coming as being purely of a, a temporal protest. deliverance. <laughs> yeah, well, that too. But of being a temporal deliverance because... I also would like to believe that there were many within that crowd who had been properly taught the Jewish faith. I mean, you have you have Mary, who when she is told that she is carrying in her womb the Messiah, she gives praises. It, it indicates that she understood what this meant. Um, you know, she didn't act terrified as... You know, any young woman might act if they were told, hey, you're pregnant. Guess what? Surprise. It's God. Um, but no, she gives praise and thanksgiving and is in awe that God would look upon her and see her as suited to be the mother of the, the son of God, the Messiah. So I'm of the opinion that there were mixed within these crowds, not just those who had misunderstood the purpose of the Messiah as one who was coming to be a temporal deliverer of Israel and to elevate them above all the nations of the world, which was a false understanding. I believe that there were also quite a number who were properly taught the Hebrew scriptures and understood that this was about eternal deliverance. Gotcha. But it, it was easy, I'm sure, for the Jewish people in that time under the thumb of of the Roman Empire to adopt that common misconception that he was there for temporal deliverance. All right. All right, let's get back to Chucklehead here. Is a demand, it is a hope. That literally means save us. Save us, save our children, Save those who walk into a church, a mosque, a synagogue. Hosanna. Save us. It I'm pretty sure not all of those people pray to the same God. Um, only if you only only if you're a Unitarian would you believe yes. that. <laughs> and my response to those who say, Oh yeah, we pray to the same God is 
Go ask the Muslim if they pray to the same God as the Christians. Go ask the Orthodox Jew if they pray to the same God as the Christians. Right. With the Orthodox Jew, you might get an answer that, well, it's the same God. If you ask a Muslim, they will most certainly tell you no. Right. Exactly. It is the shout you heard 2,000 years ago, as this scripture recounts, and it is the shout in all of those silences and in all of those voices that repeated over the last week. Save us, Hosanna. It is a prayer, it is a demand, and it is a hope. <laughs> I wish I had something alcoholic. <laughs> Drink. Um. So, this is an interesting parallel and a really stupid one, but it's not surprising coming from a lefty, because what you and I have talked about so many times in the past is how the leftist Christian replaced God with government. Yes, politics is their primary religion. And so he is trying to tie the, the, the Israelites who are there praising and shouting for Jesus to save them when he enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday with the people who are protesting for gun control in, this, in the state capitol. Yes. They're not calling out to Jesus. They're calling out to government to do something. So there, he is here equating government with... Now, Romans 13, government is ordained by God, but he is now saying, if you're shouting to, to politicians to save you, to do something, it's the same as what the Israelites were doing when they were calling on God to save them. Unfortunately, though, if he knew anything of the scriptures, it was the politicians who executed Jesus. Right. Right. Idiots. <laughs> he has such a beautiful pulpit. Why isn't he using it? That that is, it's a pretty church. I, I don't understand why he's not using the pulpit over here. I this think is, it's nice that the pulpit hasn't been desecrated by his presence. But, but then, then there's that. So yeah, <laughs> good point. Good. That's a fair point. Yes, his sermon actually belongs down here on the floor. <laughs> That makes more sense. Matthew wants to make sure that you know it's a hope when you read this story. Drink. He frames the story of Jesus entering in the, to the city as a fulfillment of the prophet Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was a prophet after the exiles returned and rebuilt the second temple in Israel. And yet there was a lot of question about what happens next. Will there be a new Davidic king? Will there be someone to lead us? And Zechariah had the hope and wrote about the Drink. hope of a king who would come humbly on a donkey, on a coal, coming into the city humbly to lead people. And Matthew make sure that you hear that that hope is fulfilled as Jesus walks into the city. But what you may not catch, because Matthew doesn't quote that part, is that there was a very specific vision for what sort of king that would be. Matthew quotes Zechariah 9.9, but Zechariah 9.10 goes on to say that this king will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow, the weapons of war, shall be cut off, and that king shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Okay. Eternal reality versus temporal reality. This is the Micah four thing again, right? Basically. Well, the messianic prophecies 
And this is what just about every leftist who tries to read their anti-gun agenda into the scriptures does, is they take a look at those passages that speak to the eternal reality that the Messiah would bring about, namely the salvation of sinners. And they misinterpret these verses to apply to some temporal political sense. No, this doesn't mean that Jesus is going to abolish war. The war that Christ abolishes is the war for our souls that is waged by Satan. And that war was accomplished on Calvary's cross. This isn't some sort of prophecy that Christ's coming would then nullify the violence that takes place in this world. You right. have to be completely naive to think that that's the case. To yeah, think the, that the prophecies ahead. are talking about the prophecies are talking about the end times when he comes yes. back, and there's no need for any of that stuff anymore because he's ruling. Yes, as long as mankind is in charge down here, there's going to be warfare. There's going to be killing, and you. What is it? here? Here is a very good rule of thumb for when it comes to biblical interpretation. If there is any interpretation of select passages within Scripture that did not exist before the 1500s, it's typically modern BS where they're injecting their political ideology into this. Um, not to pick on, on people of devout Christians that are of other denominations, but this is very common when it comes to the, you know, you talked about the end times, the idea of the millennia, that this is the premillennial time, that there is going to be a rapture. None of that teaching existed before the early 1800s. It's all modern interpretations that, that were completely unheard of before the, the early 19th century. So, this guy's interpretation, any interpretation that is modern, if the church of antiquity did not confess it, it probably isn't true. Right. Right. So, and, and Zechariah is talking about warfare. Yes. Right. He's talking about breaking bows and, and the king bringing peace. The, he's equating warfare with, with a crazy trans person with a <laughs> a Keltec sub 2000 shooting up a, a Christian school. They're completely different things. He's talking about peace on earth and warfare between nations. What, yes. what we're talking about, what, what actually we're should be ad addressing is the, is the sin in the heart of mankind that causes people to do what happened at covenant school. Yeah. And it, it's much more convenient to attack your political opponents. And it's much more to demonize uh, an object like an, an AR 15, which wasn't even used in this case. Um, but they want to, to demonize inanimate objects because that's a lot easier than talking about the fallenness of man and the depravity of man's heart and addressing the human condition that causes this. A person doesn't need to have access to a firearm to commit an act of evil. We look at the Waukesha killer. Right. Perfect example. If a person is determined to do uh, unspeakable evil against their fellow man, they're going to do it with anything at their disposal, whether that be a firearm or a vehicle. Yep. And we see it. We saw it in the knife attacks and we see it in knife attacks in China. We saw it in the. What there was, was the, the case in Central Park where it was uh, a radical Islamist who had rented a large vehicle and used it to plow through a crowd of people. Yep. And then there was the, the guy in the pickup truck a few years ago who was just riding through the bicycle lanes mowing people down you got that crazy guy in nice france in in the truck who killed way more than any mass shooter in american history um just running them over with a truck evil will yeah. find a way 
and you can't ban your way out of e- to to save yourself from evil. You'll end up basically sitting at home alone, kind of like we did under COVID. <laughs> yeah, losing our minds and drinking ourselves to death. No one suggests banning automobiles or alcohol when a drunk driver kills someone. Yep. We address the issue. We address the drunk driving. Why don't we do that when it comes to acts of evil committed by madmen with firearms? Yep. Agreed. All right. So let's see here. What's next? Um, the cries for Hosanna, the cries for salvation to be saved. Oh, in the here and now that happened in the street in Jerusalem, that happened in our streets, our cries for peace and the breaking of weapons of war. <laughs> That's not even Matthew close. Also wants to make sure that you hear that this king who is coming, this king who is entering into the city through the gates is not like any king that you have seen before. Now, there are scholars who tell us that this scene in the city of Jerusalem, this pomp and circumstance where Jesus rides a donkey in and there are palms that are being waved, scholars tell us that this is a sort of parody. That emperors, that Caesar would, in order to show his military might, would parade on horses with grand battalions in order to show strength with flags and slogans and signs of power. And here Jesus comes on a donkey and a colt, the opposite of power, while the people shout, save us. Drink. Do something. May there be peace. A little sip so I don't get inebriated. Yeah, because this is this is not easy. I should I really should have joined you in this. this would have been great. <laughs> I didn't think to make this into a drinking game. It's funny he's he's how badly he misses the point here, right? Jesus didn't come to bring peace on earth in Jerusalem 2000 years ago to bring peace to the Israelites. And he even said so himself. I didn't come to bring peace, but you know, I, I came to bring a sword, a sword. He talks about, uh, about loved ones turning against each other because of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, this is just mind boggling, but again, keep in mind the primary religion is leftism. They just sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on top to make it sound kind of Jesus-y and Christian-y. <laughs> There's sort of a parallel here. I mean, yeah. they were shouting, they were shouting to save us. We're shouting for gun control. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah. And I mean, one of one of the ways to debunk this kind of nonsense is you have the example of of Jesus and the centurion, the centurion who comes to him and says, you know, please heal my servant who's near death. And Jesus doesn't say, you know, before I do that, you should really stop being an employee of the Roman government because that's really bad. And you have these weapons of war that you towed around. And I came to break those things. Yes. Instead, what does Jesus say? He says, go your way. Your servant has been healed. You know, we use the example of, of Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane that he didn't say, Peter throw down that sword and never take it up again. He said, Peter, put it back into its place. So there is a place and a time for it. Yes. Yes. Uh, So, and you never once in the gospels see Jesus in any way trying to undermine the government. You know, one of the accusations against him was that he was trying to tell people not to pay taxes to Caesar. But what did he say? He said, pay to Caesar what is Caesar's and pay to God what is God's. Right. So this chucklehead makes Jesus sound like he was some kind of revolutionary, makes him sound like he was some sort of pacifist and some guy who wanted to overthrow the establishment. 
But Jesus never acts that way. Oh, come Maybe. on. That's not what the He Gets Us commercials tell us. Oh. <laughs> yeah. If I see that one with the, the, the gangsters and the skateboard guys again, I will oh, I'll just throw up. He Gets Us. Uh, okay. Where were we? Um, where are we? We're at 8.01. They shout because there is hope that Jesus might be the fulfillment of that Davidic line, that Jesus might be that son of David. But Matthew also wants to make sure that this is like no king you have ever seen. Because after Jesus comes into the city, he goes into the temple, he disrupts the temple, but then he heals. Notice he kind of sugarcoated the whole thing in the temple <laughs> yeah and never mind that whole stuff about forming a weapon with you know a cord uh, a whip of uh, and, and driving the money changers he disrupted the temple you know yes. he stood he's like those those guys who stood in the well of the the tennessee house and 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 he disrupted that's what he yeah. did he was a peaceful <laughs> demonstrator Mostly peaceful because the whole whips thing. Mostly peaceful, <laughs> right? We can't talk about whips. That just uh. <laughs> conjures up too many terrible images. And note that he also doesn't state the reason that Jesus was incensed and filled with anger and was overthrowing those tables. It was because they have desecrated the house of his father with those things that are pure filth. So a little bit of, of inside information on this. Within the temple, you have the court of the Gentiles. This was the place that was reserved for those who were not Jewish by birth, but yet they worshipped the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. And what would happen, especially leading up to any festivals where devout Jews would come from a great distance, is that they would set up within the court of the Gentiles the sale of livestock and the exchange of money. You couldn't pay the temple tax with the drachma, the coin of the, the Roman realm. You had to change your your Roman money into the shekel, the, the, the uh, coin of the temple in order to pay the temple tax because it was considered idolatry because the Roman coins had the image of Caesar on them, who was considered to be a God by, by the pagan religions of the Roman empire. Right. And so Jesus goes into the court of the Gentiles, which is where all this was taking place to overthrow that because they had desecrated the place of worship for the Gentiles. They had dirtied up the the house of the father of the temple with animals who were crapping and pissing all over the place, not to mention the fact that these money changers would charge a fee, which was a violation of Jewish law against charging interest for a loan. It was considered the practice of usury, which was forbidden. They're taking so, advantage of the people who came from far and wide to, to, to yes. pray at the temple. Yes. And didn't have the money for the tax or they they needed something to sacrifice. They couldn't bring their livestock from home from wherever they came. So they buy it there at the temple and somebody's the, the, the money changers, the people that Jesus drove out with the whip. They were taking advantage of Christians. They were or not Christians of, of the children of God. Yes. They were they were taking advantage of of the people who had come to worship and, and that's, denying devout devout gentiles their space of worship as well right and and so it's kind of the equivalent when you in your sermon tried to make political points against you know gun control and that kind of thing isn't that kind of the same thing of secularizing the house of the lord dirtying it up yeah yeah you're 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 dragging you're dragging God's word through the filth of of the political fights that we constantly yes. go through. The only time where it was is acceptable to speak to any issue that is considered p 
political is if those are moral issues that are addressed by God's word, such as the evil of abortion. Right. Right. Because at that point you're you're addressing a fifth commandment issue, or for our reformed brethren, a sixth commandment issue. Right. Um, so yeah. All right. Let's see what else. Let's see how many. Oh, you got ahead of the drinking. I had to catch up. <laughs> And in 2 Samuel, the Hebrew Bible book that tells the story of David, it talks about how David was so put off and disgusted by the sick and the lame that he had them sent out of Jerusalem. And here is Jesus, this king who comes on a donkey, offering healing and hope Drink. to those who are sick and lame. <laughs> And sick and tired of being sick and lame. Jesus this is sermon is lame. No king <laughs> has seen, Matthew tells us. That should be another drinking point. Every time he says this is a king like no other, you should drink. So it's it's Hosanna, hope, a demand, pray, a prayer, a demand. Oh, yeah, prayer, demand, a hope. Yeah, yeah. Prayer, demand, a hope. Hosanna. A king like no other should probably drink twice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much left. I got to. Yeah, you're problem. running a little low. They didn't bring enough for this guy. Who are saying, do something. Hosanna. Drink. Follow him into the city. I've served here at First Christian Church for almost eight years. And Those I've poor lost people. Count I know. Of how many times we, as a pastoral staff, have spoken about gun violence, whether that is in a sermon or a prayer. But I can tell you this there have been more mentions of gun violence from this pulpit over those almost eight years, more than there have been Easter sermons proclaimed. And I hate that. I do too. I, yeah. <laughs> he admits that he preaches the politics of gun control more than proclaiming the resurrection. So here's yeah. a hint. Stop. Right. <laughs> Maybe maybe don't focus on politics and maybe keep preaching the resurrection instead. Oh, but we can't do that. No. It causes me deep grief and anger. It may cause you concern. Oh, yeah. It may cause you anger it may cause you to ask huge questions about what it is we are to do some of you may find another church by the fact that we've talked about it that much instead of <laughs> proclaiming resurrection exactly yes that we worship a god who is emmanuel who is with us through all things and so we must talk about all of the things that God has promised to be there with us. Okay, fair point. But I don't think the talking is, I don't think that he means it the way I think you and I would think of yeah. it. Yeah. The being with us part. I, I he means This sermon it, is the equivalent of that that bumper sticker that that pro-democrat bumper sticker that jesus rode a donkey if you've ever seen that one oh yes my response to that is he made that donkey his bitch pardon, pardon the term <laughs> you can bleep that out if you want to um save that for the gun club members that's <laughs> special extra content but th this, yeah, this sermon is, 
there are no redeeming qualities from this sermon. This there would really have aren't. been this would have been an opportunity. Put yourself in. All right, so I, we've got what about four minutes left? Three minutes left. Put yourself in in the pulpit uh, in his place. What's the approach on the in the aftermath of something like this? What's the approach to provide your congregation with hope as he keeps talking about? Yeah. What how would you preach this on Palm Sunday if you're going to address that question of gun violence or violence in general? Sure, sure. What uh, would you do? You look at the Psalms and there are plenty of of prayers for deliverance in the Psalms. And yet David was was a man whose life was threatened perhaps more than any man who's ever walked this earth. Except, of course, Christ himself, the Son of God, who was threatened with, with uh, death from the time he started his earthly ministry. And we, we take a look at that. We take a look at the prayer in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. And so when evil comes upon us, does that cause us then to doubt our faith and to run away from God that he has somehow broken his promises to us? You have to make the distinction between temporal evil and eternal evil. We live in a fallen world. We live in the kind of broken world that killed the Son of God. And so, yes, our hearts are deeply grieved when we experience these kinds of tragedies or when our loved ones are afflicted by these kinds of tragedies or we happen to know somebody who knows somebody who was killed at this tragedy. And our hearts ache for that. But we look to Christ for comfort. For he endured the affliction for our sins. So that even when we encounter this kind of evil, we know that we have an eternal dwelling place with him. At the same time, we also learn that it is important as those who have received forgiveness from Christ to in turn forgive those who have done such great wickedness to us and to leave them in the hands of our God rather than seek vengeance on our own. Um, this would have been a perfect opportunity to preach of the peace that we have, the eternal peace that we have in Christ. And yet he chose to make this a political sermon instead. Yeah. Jesus did not enter into this world through the womb of the Virgin Mary to be your buddy on the political stump. He came here to be your savior. He came here to be your savior from sin, death, and the devil. And if you see Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as an excuse to, to preach about gun violence, you know, for, for Palm Sunday, I focused on how Christ went into Jerusalem knowing exactly what would happen, that he would die the most brutal death imaginable, and yet he did it anyway. Preach the gospel. Don't preach this political BS. Preach the gospel. If you're if you're gonna preach <clears throat> if you're gonna preach gun violence as a means of turning people's eyes to the cross, that's one thing. Yeah. So you can then Comfort them with the gospel. Flee for refuge to Christ. Right. Yeah. But that's not what he's doing here. He's he's turning your eyes to government. Yeah. Jesus came to save the Israelites. The government's here to save you. So go go shout Hosanna at the governor of Tennessee. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't work all way too many times in this speech and it's a speech it's not a sermon and so i ask this of you do what you can here's your answer write a letter call your representative research common sense legislation that can change gun violence like the fix nix bill that was Voted down by every Democrat. So yeah. I have a theory, and this is 
this definitely does not put the best construction on everything like you might have learned if you're an older person and you learned it through small catechism. <laughs> I Explain believe everything in the kindest way. Yes. That's the, yeah, the new version. <laughs> um, I believe that leftist Democrats intentionally will not take those efforts to curb this kind of violence because there are no political gains to be made if you're able to curb this kind of violence. Yeah, yeah, because the, the, the same sin that drives people to shoot people at a church drives people to maneuver in politics for personal gain. Yes. It's, the same, it's the same old Adam that, that drives us to seek to benefit from the, the suffering of others. That's exactly what these people in Washington and the state capitals yeah. are doing. They're, Every they're time not these, interested, yeah. like you said, not interested in actually solving the problem. They want to benefit from it politically. Right, right. They start sending out their fundraising emails the second the bullets are have been have left the the barrel of the gun. Um, vote for us, and we'll make this kind of thing stop. Vote for us, and we'll pass gun control. Donate to my campaign so that I can bring an end to this. Mm hmm. And then it doesn't happen because it's not within their power and they know it. Right. And here he is comforting people after this horrible shooting with activism instead of the gospel. Go write your politicians. Go research gun laws. What is, how is that supposed to comfort people in the aftermath of something like right. this? Not turn to Christ and walk with him each day because you never know when your final hour may come. Right. Oh, go out and go out and lobby Congress. That'll make you feel better. Around the country. Read every perspective on it that you can and find the best solid common sense solution. Wait a minute. There's another buzzword. That should be three shots. Common uh, sense. If, you're, if you're playing the yeah, common sense. <laughs> so listen to all perspectives, but then he throws in the common sense thing because what is common sense to you and me is not common sense to him no. or people like him. Their idea of common sense is banning guns and making criminals out of law abiding citizens. Right. Not actually doing something to stop the violence and get people off the streets. It's we got to we got to ban the guns. We got to control the guns. We got to do. We got to pass ex universal background checks, which would do nothing to actually curb violence anywhere. Right. It's it's just stupid. And to sit here and tell people to listen to all perspectives, but then to preach to them one perspective. Infuriating. March tomorrow in Nashville. I'm planning on going. Give me a call if you want to come with me. And we will go. This is a march that will be led by children and their parents and pediatricians and pastors from across the state. What do these people know about? Okay. <laughs> pediatricians. <laughs> Why pediatricians? Do they have some special insight into, into the gun violence? What <laughs> pediatricians, pastors do because they, or they should, because they understand the, the darkness in the heart of, of man. But this guy doesn't. Yeah. Well, you know what it is of pediatricians <laughs> is that nowadays they try to ask the kids without their parents present, do you feel safe? Are there any guns in the home? Right. And even with my, my kids being in, in high school sports, that, there is on the form for your, you know, for the state high school uh, physical that the kids have to get to play sports. Are there any guns in the home? And I just told the kids just answer no. It's none of their business. Right. Yeah, because refusing to answer is basically saying yes. Yeah, so just say no. Yeah. It's the Nancy Reagan thing. Um, yeah. I mean, it, these are the same 
are these the same pediatricians who are telling our kids that they might be the opposite sex and they need to, you know, not tell their parents about that? And the, yeah. these are all synonyms for activists who think like me and agree with my politics. Right. Exactly. And none of them have any special insight into no. how we actually stop this stuff. It's all, well, they're pediatricians. They know about kids. Oh, these are children. They know about going to school. And yeah, there, there is much experts on crime control as Greta Thunberg is on climate change. I just thought of her at the same time you did. <laughs> and I that line. Yep. All right. So let's see. Say, ho, zan, na. Drink. Do something. I'm empty. And if it Can me dry. bothers you, <laughs> that maybe the solutions that come from the church and from church leadership may sound a little too political. I want to a remind little? you of the root of the word political. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> if it bothers us that you're being political, well, yeah, it does, because you don't need to get into it. But we're now going to get a, a grammar lesson on the root words that form where where politics comes from and this is maddeningly stupid polis the city mm -hmm. you hear that in the word metropolis minneapolis all of the opolises all of the cities that use that greek root and so to be about the business of politics is to be about the business of the city the place where we live the place I don't live in a city Jesus led those shouting save us hosanna do drink, something drink, Jesus drink. led them I wish I could it's all gone to the city to proclaim <laughs> peace to work for peace and to proclaim life even when death looked him square in the face Friends, it is a prayer. It is a demand and it is a hope. That all right, so if you're playing at home, <laughs> demand the demand prayer hope thing is three shots. Okay. <laughs> it's not one, it's three. And we are not responsible if you we get total alcohol poisoning. I have no responsibility at all for this. I'm drinking if, if this, yeah. tea tonight. If this episode results in you making a trip to the emergency room, that's not our fault. Right. We are um, washing our hands of any of this. I was always of the opinion that politics just meant many blood-sucking parasites. It does. <laughs> that's... <laughs> but... Oh. <sighs> That's a the that's a really strained connection, right? Because G, the, the 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 story for Palm Sunday is Jesus Jesus riding into the city of Jerusalem, and so politics comes from the city. It should all tie together somehow. It's as bad as the Hitler had a dog too argument. <laughs> Didn't we make that? We 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 ran into that logic somewhere, and I, I I've got a it was. I have a clip something about something about Hitler. Hitler was a painter. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <clears throat> the word polis, the reason that we use it is because at the time it came into being the greeks didn't have nation states they had cities yes. they it, everything was a city state every city had its own governor yeah it was its own country into itself that that the, the idea of the nation state is a, is a much later development this this is so strained trying to tie these two things together it's sort of like that whole 
Well, I have to, I have to go back and listen to that, that hippie homily from hell episode. <laughs> that was, that was a, that was a Palm Sunday and they were trying to make, I think the same sort of thing. I got to go back and listen to that. For those of you who have not, I, let me look that up, tell you what episode that was so that you can listen to it yourself. And there's probably uh, a chance you can make a drinking game out of that one too. Oh yeah. I'm sure there's, <laughs> yeah, we are encouraging rampant alcoholism with these episodes. Um, the hippie homily. What episode number? That was episode. Oh, come on. Did I misspell homily? <laughs> um you gotta be kidding me my own search won't find it all right uh, i'll find it i'll put it in the show notes how about that um but yeah easter and and palm sunday always end up being episode 115 how did i just searched for hippie and it came up search for hippie and it says there oh that there's something wrong with my search. I did hip. I searched for hippie. Maybe it's because of my stupid keyboards doing all caps. Oh, it won't do anything but all caps. I search for hippie and I get one of the happy hour episodes and H I P P I E. Oh, I misspelled hippie. I did misspell hippie. What an idiot. <laughs> I think I was drinking. <laughs> All right, let's let's finish this thing off. Three, uh. <sighs> Let us go into the city. Let us march into the polis. And let us pray for peace. Let us demand better alternatives than what we have now. And let us not let them take our hope. And shortly okay. after the sermon, there was a voters meeting where the uh, voters demanded better than what they have now. <laughs> One would hope. <laughs> oh God, there's another drink. I got a drink. Oh. <laughs> um, this is just, this logic is just trash. This is just horrible. The So Jesus led the crowds. So politics is built on the Greek root word polis, meaning city. Jesus rode into a city Therefore, churches should mar lead marches in the city to call for gun control. The, the logic is strained at best. At what, at any point in his ministry, did Jesus promise the people of Israel, the citizens of the city of Jerusalem, that they would be free from violence or from crime yeah. or mistreatment by the Romans? Ever? Right. Well, and, and what did Jesus say as he stood before Pilate? My kingdom is not of this world. He made it very clear that he had not come for temporal reasons, but for eternal reasons. Yep. And and again, with this this prayer as a demand BS, are you if you're demanding that God do something, then you probably don't know how prayer works. Right. When the purpose of prayer is so that your will is conformed to the Father's perfect and holy will. You know, right. it's, yes, you can pray. The only demand you should ever make in prayer is to demand that God keep his promises to you. That's <laughs> acceptable. But if you start demanding that, you know, God change the laws of this nation to be in tune with your political ideology, that's not prayer. Nope. And you've further you've made God into this kind of idol that is there to do your personal bidding. The magic genie in the bottle. That yes, you, you rub the bottle and and ask and tell him you want stuff, and it happens. I think somewhere we pray, "Thy will be done." I seem to right. remember that somewhere. That means His will, not ours. And if Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done, maybe this guy should be praying for the same thing. It's okay to pray to an end for an end to gun violence. But when you turn that into a demand for political action to change things to which God's word does not address, you've failed 
as a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, do something. Got to do something. Yeah, do something, even if it's the wrong thing. As long as it's something, just do it. I don't know whether I can stand another minute of this stuff, so we'll just cut it off here. <laughs> you got 25 seconds. Okay, okay, I can stand 25 more yeah. seconds, maybe. But I don't have anything alcoholic, this though. Is the gospel. That's no, not... not the gospel. Christ is the sort of king. This is blasphemy. Never walk by. And the teenager shouts, Hosanna, do something. Thanks be to God. That's not the gospel. Uh, it's not yeah, even and, remotely like the gospel. And Hosanna doesn't mean do something. No, it does. <laughs> I tried to find the the root and all the, the, the sources from where... The, like you were talking about earlier, where where the word Hosanna comes from, it doesn't have anything to do with doing or demanding. Right. It is it is a request for salvation, a plea for salvation. There was this movie that I had seen probably 20 years ago, and it basically the gist of it, it was Jesus having come into our present time instead of Jerusalem a thousand or two thousand years ago. And something tells me that if Jesus became incarnate 33 years ago and or 30 years ago and happened to be in the midst of his public ministry, and a teenager said to him, Do something, he'd probably say, Then go to church. Make sure it's not this guy's church, though, because he sucks. <laughs> this guy is a perfect example of why American Christianity is in trouble. It absolutely sucks because we've wrapped our politics up with, with God's word and tried to say, and tried to, to tell people that this stuff that going out and protesting and marching and writing to your, your Congressman, that this is the gospel. Yeah. And it's on both sides of the aisle. We have that Anderson character from, from uh, Arizona. Right. The, the so. pooper scooper attachment on your AK 47 guy. <laughs> yes. That is another jewel of an episode. That is, that's another one that we need to recommend to folks. Um, when was that? <laughs> um, I don't remember what the name of that episode was. Uh, it might be episode 82. God wants you to have a weapon. Yes, that's, it, that's, it was. That's, yeah. Yep. So definitely go check out episode 115 and episode 82. If you want a good laugh, um, on both sides of, of, <laughs> of this particular topic. That's, uh, final thoughts on this guy and, 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 what he's trying to do here and because this is not he's not a one-off this is no fairly unfortunately. common for for christian pastors in america today to do as you yeah. say many times take your politics and sprinkle a little jesus on it uh, this i pity him because on the last day when he is called to account for his stewardship of the gifts to which he was bestowed, what is he going to say? Because I led the pediatricians. Is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> if this is characteristic of any of his sermons, no one learned of salvation through Christ and his suffering, death, and resurrection. One of the, the most important things that was ever told to me early in my ministry, and it was by the man who, uh, the first man that I buried in my ministry. Uh, he said, make sure that every time or every sermon that you preach, preach as if there is at least one person there in the church who's never heard the gospel. If there was somebody in his church that that's the only sermon they ever heard, they they would not have heard the message of salvation. Unless they think that the government's there to save them. Well, he does only have 10 subscribers, so. It's very possible that 
And there looks yeah. like there might be 10 people in the audience. Let me see. <laughs> Let me show you this. This is this is from the beginning. There's probably 12 people here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Oh no, he didn't get twenty. Darn. Well, if you count the people who are playing the music in the back, there's maybe a baker's dozen, you know, but two dozen. There's two dozen yeah. in there. Yeah, so it, the likelihood that someone would walk into this church off the street and never have heard the gospel, probably pretty, pretty unlikely, but it could happen. Sure. And, and I like your, I like uh, that idea that you should be preaching as if there's somebody in the audience that has never heard it. He's preaching to the choir basically, because these people all have heard it for eight years which is probably why there's only 20 people in, in the audience and only 10 people are subscribing to his YouTube channel. They've heard it. They agree. They're down for the struggle. They, they buy into this. So he's preaching to the choir, but he's never going to grow this, this, this congregation beyond 20 people. If this is what he's preaching, right. He's preaching, the comfort of the gospel. He's preaching the comfort of politics and activism, which right. is not comforting at all. <laughs> and, and by every measurable statistic right now, the churches that are quote unquote traditional that uh, are, are conservative are the ones that are growing. Yeah, we, we have a little, a mission church that I go to and we've just about outgrown our space and we've only been in that space for two years. And, um, it's, that's encouraging. And it's not just, um, a church full of old folks. It's, it's young people far younger than me and families. And, and we are very traditional conservative church. It, Is that people, still pastor Stark that you have there? It is. Yeah. I, I knew him at seminary. Not well, but I, I think he was two years behind me. I can't recall. He's, uh, he's fantastic. And, and it's exactly the message that, that people are craving to hear because if you're turning to, to politics, if you're turning to politicians for salvation, you're going to be disappointed. I don't care how talented, I don't care if it's Ron DeSantis. I don't care if it's Ronald Reagan you're going to be disappointed if you're putting your hope in, in humans, especially human politicians. Yeah. All right. That was fun. I wish we, that I was. wish I had, I wish we had made that a drinking game, which I wish we hadn't thought of that, had thought of that in, in time to do that. Uh, maybe I'll go back and rewatch it just for the fun of it. That, that would have been very difficult though, to, to only drink in moderation. <laughs> Well, it's not moderation if you're doing it like we were suggesting. <laughs> Hope, prayer, demand. Yeah. Maybe maybe a teaspoon each time. And yeah. Just, yeah, small shots. <laughs> Either that or you better buy two bottles. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Pastor, this, it's been a long time coming. I'm glad we did this. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, we should... Uh, definitely do this again uh as we had planned last time maybe we'll do this again next uh next episode um we'll see we'll see how things go next week but thank you thank you for joining us i really appreciate it it's been a pleasure and folks if you have any comments or any questions about what you heard on this episode please feel free to sound off at uh at the feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback. Leave us a voice. I, th I don't think you can send us a, a, vo a an email anymore because email, you can't leave a text comment anymore because that just got filled up with all kinds of spam and crap. So you can leave a voice message and we will play it in a future episode. I've got one sitting in the hopper that I need to, uh, we need to respond to, although it's not all that interesting. Um, 
but uh, be sure to, to check that out and, and let us know what you think. And if you have a suggestion for a video like this crazy one uh, that we could dissect in a future, uh, future show, please do let us know. Um, so thank you for, for uh, watching. Thank you for your support and um, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time.